This We're conference gonna ask that will now be recorded. We're going to ask that everyone hold their comments or, or questions until the end. Um, we will, uh, Eric, uh, Joel, and I are committed to uh, staying on until eight o'clock Eastern to you know to answer questions. Uh, so if we do consume the full hour in terms of, of prepared comments, uh, we will take that time um, to to hear you out and and try to try to answer questions. Um, for tonight's meeting, uh, we are going to be recording this. It will be posted on the on the website, both the the slide content and the recording. So uh, it will be there for uh, anyone that you wish to to have access it. They'll be able to hear what was said. Um, and then, so and for tonight, the content um, you're going to hear from three people. Uh, myself, I'm John Stacy, president of Florida Youth Soccer. Uh, Joel Dragan, the executive director of Florida Youth Soccer, and then Eric. Idol is our treasurer for Florida Youth Soccer. Um, so, so in the interest of time, we're going to jump right into the the uh, first of several decisions that have been made by the board. Um, uh, so first up, we're going to talk about return to play. Um, so last night, um, go ahead and do next slide, Joel. So last night, the the board met uh, for uh, over two hours um, to deal with a number of topics, um, most of which will be talked about tonight. Um, we we've we have for the last uh, month and a half it seems uh, every couple of weeks we'll meet and we'll push the date further realizing that that's very frustrating it's frustrating for you for you the members it's frustrating for us as a board uh we don't have certainty um we are as as all of you are aware we're, uh, state of florida is currently in phase one of a of a return to normalcy plan uh all but three counties right so the southern uh, most counties i guess i think miami dade uh, Broward and probably I think Palm Beach uh, remain in in the, the zero phase at this point, but 64 of the counties are in phase one, and we've been reviewing the documents. Uh, several of the board members have been, you know, monitoring the news, uh, gathering information from you know national sources, from local sources, reading everything we can to understand what these phases look like and what the phased approach looks like. Um, the board decided last night that we believe that soccer and a return to soccer in some fashion on the field fits best in phase three. And so what we've decided to do is establish and to make so that you have some clarity is that uh, we will begin our, our return to the field uh, on the same date that phase three is enacted. Uh, so at this point in time, there's supposed to be approximately two weeks or actually two weeks between phase one, two, in phase two and three. So on the date that phase three starts, if that ends up being say June 1st, then we are, uh, then t uh, clubs will be permitted to allow t players back on the field for practice activities. That will be the only sanctioned activity that, that FYSA will cover during that time period. There will be a two week window. At the end of that two weeks, the presumption is that we would then be um, at the end of the first two weeks of phase three and ready to go to normalcy. Uh, and at that point, we would allow for the opening of, um, for additional things to include tryouts, league play, and even tournament play. Uh, you'll find out here soon that we are canceling our, our cup events. So the state will not be offering any additional events, but we will give freedom to those clubs, tournament organizations, and league organizations that choose in response to whatever um, their league members wish to do or whatever their, their local clubs wish to do, they can offer these, these products, um, presumably starting two weeks after phase three. Um, so this is the, um, and Joel, I need to, at the bottom, it, it blacks out or it, it blocks what's on the very bottom there. Um, but just know that the guidance does apply to all sanctioned activities. And so that, again, that two week period will be practice only, um, no games, no no league play, no tournaments. That's the only practice. And again, we want to allow time. We understand that not all localities are going to make the same decision to open it up, you know, exactly on that same day. So we hope over that first two weeks leading up to a potential date for tryouts that that would give um, those local um, authorities the opportunity to evaluate and to give the green light to local clubs. Next slide. So that that really leads us into the, the questions that we've been receiving around tryouts. 
So the board made some discuss, uh, discuss this last night, and we've made the following uh, determinations that prior to May 18th, affiliates can only roster offer roster spots for the 2020-21 seasonal year to those players that are already registered with their club for this year. Um, that is not a change from our, our practice. May 18th was the, the announced trial date. That was the date following the, the full completion of round of 16. For State Cup, it was the intended date. So it aligns with what our rules were. So the board is expecting that nobody will be offering spots to, to anyone other than, than members of their own club until May 18th. On May 18th, um, you can, uh, affiliates would then be permitted to begin to contact and offer roster spots to players from any, what, regardless of, of this year's status. Um, again, this aligns with the ability that a player would have to attend uh, in-person tryouts uh, if we were allowed to have them. And so that, those contacts are permitted. Um, and from there to May 18th until June 10th, uh, organizations will have the opportunity to make those offers, to enter into contracts. Um, the contracts themselves by rule uh, do not become effective until June 10th. That's the first date that organizations are allowed to register their players with FYSA. And that is by rule 203.1, the date on which all contracts become binding. Our rule also states that if there's a question as to the refundability of fees, it is based on the agreement between the parties. So, you know, if if you're a club and you have a non-refundable fee and your parent signs it, um, that is between you two. FYSA will not adjudicate those. Uh, we are not involved in the discussion around the refundability. And again, that's based on the uh, rules, the rules that we have in place. Um, next slide, Joel. So this is rule 203.1, wanted to, to show, show it to you just in case there was any question. Um, so this is when um, you, you register the players on June 10th. Um, uh, prior to that, uh, the agreements uh, can be revoked. Next slide. This is the tryout rule. There will be, there is no change. So, so there were several things that the board discussed. Uh, we've been, we have got received questions about not in good standing. We've received questions um, you know, around the poaching rule. And we try to address that with the prior statements regarding the May 18th. Um, the not in good standing procedures and timelines will stay the same. Uh, clubs have until uh, 5 p.m. on the Friday before Memorial Day. This year that falls on Friday, May 22nd at 5 p.m. Um, you, there are specific, in the rule, there are specific guidelines as to what has to be submitted by the club and there are procedures that are in place. So nothing changes in regards to not in good standing. Uh, clubs still have to make that determination and file with FYSA in a timely manner. Next slide. Registration timeline. So we're not gonna change, we're not change, making any changes to the, um, to the June 10th uh, timeframe. Uh, yes, tryouts may be pushed to June 15th if, uh, if, all, if everything goes to plan. Um, but you don't have to start registering on June 10th. You certainly can uh, wait beyond that. But, you know, based on our rules, any contract that you sign on June 10th becomes effective whether or not you register with the register that player. So um, you do have some protection there. And then also reaffiliation requirements and timelines. So, so organizations uh, that, that choose to re reaffiliate will still follow the same um, calendar. And, and do everything that we've done in the past. There's no changes. Um, it's also, there's no change to the, uh, to the background check switch that will occur on July 1st when folks will start to be able to apply or do the background checks for the upcoming year. Next, Joel. All right, so I'm gonna, um, I'll just make the comment first before I hand it over to Joel is that the board did decide last night that all of our competitions, State Cup, President's Cup, Futures Cup, and Commissioner's Cup uh, competitions would not continue for any or in all age groups. Uh, and then USYS has also already can had already canceled their regional and national events. And so I'm going to turn it over to Joel to talk about what that looks like for our clubs in terms of refund of fees. So take it away, Joel. 
Thanks, John. Thanks. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the board voted uh, just last night after a lot of debate and a, a couple of um, former uh, pushbacks of making the decision that, that we will uh, cancel these four uh, tournaments that we have listed here that are all uh, state sponsored. I'd like to mention also that this doesn't necessarily apply to sanctioned tournaments or affiliate tournaments that we have out there. Once they, um, once we uh, progress beyond the two weeks beyond phase three, as John mentioned before, those affiliate, affiliated tournaments can uh, take place. Uh, starting with State Cup, so I, I guess in general, before uh, we get into this, I'd like to mention that all of this information will be posted to the website, this slide deck, as well as um, uh, separate memos that will go out to uh, clubs and teams about this. So you don't need to write feverishly. You, you'll receive this information in a number of different ways. Uh, but uh, every tournament was in a different place when you look at uh, State Cup, President's Cup, Futures, and Commissioner's Cup. So there is different um, refund or credit opportunities uh, for each one. So I'll go through <clears throat> each tournament individually. Um, starting with State Cup, uh, the 2020 registration fee was obviously $900. Uh, you'll see this theme throughout uh, many of the cups in that uh, teams will have the option of a uh, partial refund or a uh, full credit for the, uh, the event next year. Um, you can see here that this does include specific to State Cup, the 18 and 19 teams. They did uh, participate in the fall of 2019. So um, all of those teams will not be receiving a refund, unfortunately. The, uh, there, there will be an online team uh, form submission, which will be available tomorrow. I'll get into how you can access that form because we're going to have each team request, uh, make a decision on if, with, if they want a partial refund or if they want uh, a credit for next year. So first talking about the credit specific to State Cup. Uh, first, uh, it's been posted on our website, but the State Cup fee uh, is going up next year due to the costs uh, that it will that we'll incur for sending teams to regionals. The regional fee increase, so our State Cup fee has to as well. Uh, the 2021 uh, State Cup fee will be $925. You'll note that you'll get a full credit toward next year's State Cup, um, so you're getting a little bit more if if the teams elect to take a credit for uh, next year, they will receive a full credit. Uh, they won't have to uh, pay for the extra $25. The credit will be issued in uh, Got Soccer uh, as a voucher <coughs> sent to the club. Uh, so it, the, the club will manage these vouchers, will send it to them, so they won't necessarily have to use it for the team that they got the credit for. If they would uh, prefer to opt for a refund, there will be an $800 refund, again, sent directly to the clubs. FYSA is going to deal with the clubs directly on this rather than uh, refunding the individual credit cards. Again, I'll get into some of the nuts and bolts on this later, but again, if you want a refund for State Cup, it's $800 sent directly to the club. And um, that, that $800 is less our incurred costs for things like credit card processing, awards and gifts, admin fees that, that, that took place in order to plan the tournament. Uh, full credit, uh, if you take it, refund less $100 for uh, State Cup. President's Cup refund, um, we'll, we'll just go through the same process. The, the entry fee for this year was $750. Um, again, President's Cup was a little bit more complicated because different teams were at different places of the tournament, depending on how many teams were in an individual bracket. If there were more than 32 teams in a bracket, they had to start in round one. If there were less than 32 teams, they went on directly into round two. And some teams played into round two, some didn't. Uh, so, so this one, we had to take a slightly different approach. Uh, teams remaining in the competition will have the option for a partial refund for t uh, or a credit for 2021 President's Cup. I put an asterisk next to it because it's not all teams. You'll notice teams who have been eliminated from the competition will not be offered a refund. Again, there will be an online individual team form submission that will be available tomorrow for teams to give their choice. They'll have the choice between a credit 
to a full credit for 2021 President's Cup or a refund, a partial refund. Now, the full credit um, will, will be a little bit different depending on where these teams were within the competition. This can get a little confusing. Again, we will send it out to everybody, uh, th this exact text most likely uh, to teams in, in the coming days so they can see it. The, the credit, if they opt to take it, will be a full credit if the teams have not played any games in the competition. That will be a full credit for $850 which you'll note is what the President's Cup team fee is going up to next year. If the teams had played any games in the competition, we had some teams that had played one game, some that had played two, some that had played three, the credit for next year's competition will be $650. If they had played any games yet, the, get, the credit is $650. Again, as with State Cup, the credit will be issued in Got Soccer. It'll be a voucher sent directly to the club applicable for any team within that club for next year's uh, registration. If they should opt for a refund, again, seeing that teams were in different places within the tournament, there will be two refund options. $650 uh, will go to teams who had played no games. $600 will go to teams who uh, had played any games. And again, this is uh, less the, the incurred cost from FYSA for <laughs> credit card processing, awards, gifts, and uh, admin fees that, that we had put into, certainly more fees uh, here that, that we had since we had started the tournament. Futures Cup. Uh, the uh, 2020 uh, Futures Cup registration fee was $225. Uh, Futures Cup won't be offered uh, in 2021. So there are no forms to submit and there are no credits that, that will be offered in the future. All teams will receive automatically a $200 uh, refund that will be sent directly to the clubs. And again, that's just less uh, $25 for incurred costs and uh, credit card processing uh, and so on. Lastly, uh, Commissioner's Cup. Uh, Commissioner's Cup in uh, regions A, B, and C were, again, challenging, given that they were at different places throughout the tournament. Uh, the 2020 registration fee for Commissioner's Cup was $400. Uh, what I'm going to read below only applies to teams in regions A and B. Uh, region C had made it to the uh, semifinals or finals for everybody. So that there will be no refunds for teams eliminated or, or teams that participated in the Region C Commissioner's Cup. And uh, the, the refunds will be given to teams who had um, no games played or, or they will have the option to receive a partial refund. So again, there will be a form to submit. Uh, I'll get onto the forms in the next slide. Uh, but they will have the option of a full credit for next year's Commissioner's Cup 2021 if they played zero games. Again, credit given back and got soccer via a voucher. If they should opt for a refund, $350, less $50 in incurred cost. That only applies to teams who had played no games in the Commissioner's Cup. And um, we, we actually went ahead and looked at it. There were four teams in Region B who had played no games, and there were uh, 44 teams, I believe, in Region A who had played no games. Getting into, uh, I guess, the, the nuts and bolts on uh, how these refunds are going to work, all refunds are going to be issued in the form of a check sent directly to the club, again, if they should opt for a refund. Uh, credits are an option and credits are advantageous, uh, at least for President's Cup and State Cup, given the, the fee increase. You could save some money for your club next year. Um, I, we're going to need to ensure that we have your correct mailing address. We've got some steps that are in place that before we actually submit it, we will um, reach out to your agent of record to confirm that we have the correct uh, email address. We really want to minimize the total checks that we're sending out. So the idea is to only send one check per competition per club. Uh, so if you could help us in this process by ensuring that your teams fill out 
this online process, this online uh, submission via Got Soccer, that'd be very helpful. Please try to have some patience with us as we uh, go through this. What the board of directors approved last night was over four hundred thousand dollars in refunds. Uh, th there's going to be a lot that that goes along with it. As I've mentioned, this online team submission will be available tomorrow. It will be posted on the website as well as emailed directly to the teams. If your team was involved in uh, President's Cup, State Cup, or Commissioner's Cup, you will receive uh, an automatic email that goes to the coach or manager of the team. We ask that you fill it out promptly. We'd like to get this handled as quickly as you guys would. It's gonna be a GOT soccer form where they will need their team login. So some of the, uh, the, the teams may need to contact you as the club, hopefully not if they're going to tournaments to, to obtain their username and password. We're asking for the team login simply so that we can track these teams. When you log in by team, we can see exactly what team account it was. So there will be no uh, discrepancy in what team gets a refund, what team gets a credit, so on and so forth. So the, the, the form will be available tomorrow and we're asking that all teams have the form submitted by May 25th at uh, midnight. Realize that is Memorial Day weekend. It gives you guys the long weekend, a few, week, uh, a few weeks to, to get it submitted. And uh, again, the, the form is very simple. I've taken a, a look at it. It will be available tomorrow. Five to 10 questions about your team and what option that they want to do. So it should not take them more than a couple of minutes once they get logged in there. Again, we'll have that link posted on the individual competitions, web pages, and also sent directly to the teams. Um, <clears throat> what, what we do want to note here is that ultimately with as many teams as we're talking about, there will be some who don't submit the form. Uh, the, the board uh, determined last night for those who don't submit it, the default option is, is going to be a credit for next year's competition. But we're asking everybody this final point here to fill out the form regardless. Um, that, that will just help us in, in our processing that, to know that these teams want a credit for, for next year. We're going to have a master sheet of all the teams. And uh, frankly, until we hear from all of the teams within a club, within a competition, uh, we're, we're going to hold off on processing that payment, So uh, on, on processing the refund. So please uh, try to get your teams to do it quickly. The quicker all the teams do it, the quicker that we can plan and the quicker that we could process a potential refund. You'll be hearing from us quite a bit on the refunds. And uh, with that, I'll uh, turn it over to our treasurer, Eric, uh, who will uh, speak to the uh, fee increase. Thanks, Joel. And um, just one thing to add on the prior slide, right, where we said we're sending checks to the club. So there will be no option for refunds to credit cards, and Joel already said that. But just to uh, put a little more color around that, right, every time we accept a payment or process a refund via credit cards, we pay a percentage out. So given the scope of what we're going to be paying out and refunding, it's not prudent for us to spend any more money than possible, right, because ultimately that's your money. And so we're going to do it by check. Um, and the other reason for that is if we refund it to the credit card it was paid on, if it's paid on a, you know, a credit card for a team manager like Susie's mom, right, if she then steals that money, there's no recourse against her, right? But if we send it to the club, there's rules. We know who all of you guys are. You've been background checked, and it's just another control there. Also, practically speaking, if I issue an $800 refund to your credit card, how do you then give that out in cash if you're going to divvy it up to the member, the families on your team, right? So if you're going to split that between 18 people, that means you've got to come up with $800 cash before you eventually spend that on your credit card and, and offset it. Um, so just to go on to the fee increase, so the board of directors did vote last Friday to increase the fees. So the recreational fee for the coming season will be $13 per player and $25 per player for competitive players. You can see those increases. It's $3 per player increase for rec and uh, $4 for competitive. There's no change to the background check, so we're, we're not doing anything there. Um, our cost didn't go up there, right? So the only reason we're increasing these, as you'll see a bit more in the next slide or two, is because of the insurance increase. So some of you might recall that we mentioned uh, last year's AGM that after May 1st of 2019, we received an insurance premium increase 
Um, and remember, we have to set our registration fees by May 1st each year. So we weren't able to pass that on and we, we absorb that for you. Um, so what you're seeing here in those three and four dollars is exactly what I said at the AGM last year, right? One of the questions that was brought up was, what do you think the increase will be for us? And I said, assuming no further increase, it'll be between three and four dollars. So we've, we've held true to that. We're passing on that, that uh, cost. It was a little over $300,000 that the insurance premium increase that we paid this year. And there is no reason to expect that it will go below that value in this coming year. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about that. So why, why are we increasing, right? And why did our premium go up this past year and, and will likely go up again even further this year? Um, so we've had increased general liability claims. And I say claims, that's plural, right? So there is not a single club that is to blame for these. So there may be certain instances that you hear about that are publicized a bit more than others, but there are numerous clubs um, that have had issues with coaches or different things. Um, and they range from everything from sexual assault to fights on the field um, and just general claims history. Um, and that's what SAM is. So that's sexual abuse and molestation. Yes, there have been multiple SAM cases in the state of Florida that involve FYSA and our member clubs. And again, I say clubs. It is not a specific club's fault. Um, they've been very costly. There's changes in the insurance market, right? So we've all seen everything that goes on with USA Gymnastics, with the Boy Scouts, um, with many organizations, right? So insurance companies are paying out large claims for a multitude of reasons involving youth organizations. And uh, just like when they pay out for your hurricane damage, or for your car accident, they then increase your rate or drop you, right? So in this case, they're increasing our rate. Um, also, the, just the general legal climate in the state of Florida, right? So um, if you know about insurance generally in Florida, it's a lot more expensive for things like car insurance. Why is that? Because it is so easy to file civil lawsuits in Florida and you have so many attorneys out there, one of which is me, so I, I feel uh, uh, able to criticize them you know, it's those ambulance chaser type that you hear about and, and they do, they file claims because they're easy to do and they're cheap and they can write one single letter and they can make a minimum of $10,000 and it took them one hour to do that work. So um, it, it has to do with us specifically at FYSA, but it also has to do with just the general legal climate and our society as a whole, not just in the state of Florida. Um, so what grants the authority and, and the rules around these costs? So rule 301.2 talks about fixed costs and administrative costs. So fixed costs are made up of things like you see below, which is um, the fee that we pay to the United States Soccer Federation and the fee that we're required to pay to the United States Youth Soccer Association. And those are $1 and $2.25 respectively. And that also includes our insurance premiums. Everything else is considered an administrative cost. Um, and Joel, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. So as you'll see from the rule, the uh, fixed cost the board sets every year by May 1st, um, which we did, the administrative cost, if we were to increase those, and there's no proposed increase on those this year um, or planned for any future years, um, have to be set at the AGM. They're voted on by all of you, our members, and they don't take effect until a, a, a year passes, right? So the fixed cost, though, we pass on by May 1st, and, and the board sets those. And that's just uh, a copy of the rule there. You wouldn't mind going to the next slide. Thank you, Joel. Um, so I talked a little bit about insurance, right? So you'll see kind of in the middle of the page, our 2019 total premium increase. That's this year, what we're living with right now was 330, a little bit north of that thousand dollars, right? So FYSA did not pass that on, we absorbed it. So you can see pretty easily, right? Where did we come up with that $3 and $4 per player increase? Well, we had roughly 95,000 players this year. So if you just round that to 100,000 for some easy math, that's a little more than $3 per player, right? So you clearly the only thing we is that insurance increase that we had last year. But if we go back up to the top of the slide, um, we've been advised that this year we will have a 100% premium increase. That does not mean a 100% of the $300,000 increase we had last year. That means a 100% premium increase of the total we paid last year, which was $700,000. Now, that may not end up being a 1000 this coming year um, because we expect to register less players as a result of COVID-19. 
We think there's going to be some people that have financial hardship, frankly, cannot afford to play soccer next season. So we're expecting fewer players, which is why you see the very bottom bullet on it are um, anticipated 2020 premium increase is somewhere north of $400,000. And, and that is probably, you know, that's a strictly an estimate based on us. Um, you know, as you'll see going up to the first sub bowl, we will not know what our quote is um, until 30 to 60 days before our players. And the reason for that is um, with all these claims that multiple youth organizations are having, insurance carriers are not comfortable giving a quote out very far ahead of the renewal. Just like your car insurance renewal isn't going to, they're not going to tell you six months ahead of time, right? They wait a little closer to see if you have another accident uh, before they decide what your bill will be for the next uh, next term. And so our insurance company is doing the same thing. So really, we don't know exactly what the number will be down to the penny, um, but we are expecting 100% premium increase. And that is and because of the, the claim history and, and just the general climate um, with youth organizations. Um, it is based on player and estimates. I kind of touched on that already, but just explicitly to say it, um, we do think the player numbers will be down a little bit due to COVID-19. And so that's why you see uh, that, that adjusted number there. If you look at our insurance premium increase, you can see year over year what it was. So uh, last season, 18-19, it was 421. This year, it's 685. Um, but there was nothing built into what you paid this year that covered 685. What you paid only covered 421. So FYSA absorbed that full increase for you, which was $330,000. Additionally, you may recall that last year we raised our player registration fees by $1 um, across the board. That was to cover a United States youth soccer increase of $1.25 per player. So we also absorbed 25 cents per player that same year. Um, that we didn't know about, and that was a conscious decision to do that. Um, and we're not recouping that extra 25 cents this coming year um, either. Um, and Joel, if you could go to the next slide. Just to uh, add on to that, I, I'd like to say in my conversations with um, other state associations as well as uh, experience I've seen in other states, this isn't exclusively a Florida issue. While some of the issues that Eric touched on earlier, our claims history, the, the legal climate here in Florida, um, all, all states are going through a uh, difficult time with trying to obtain uh, a, a, re, um, a new quote for this year to obtain the same insurance. There, there's some thought out there that almost no one is going to be given the same type of coverage that they had previously because of those sexual abuse and molestation charges. It's, it's not exclusive here to Florida. So um, while it is potentially worse, there, there's a lot of states who are dealing with the same issues that we are right now. So to combat all of this, um, FYSA has taken uh, what I would feel are some um, very uh, proactive uh, steps in this, um, uh, in this, uh, to combat our uh, rising insurance premium. Uh, first of all, uh, what people ask us all the time is, you know, what insurance company are you using? How how come the rates are so high? Well, we have facilitated, we're continuing to work on facilitating uh, multiple quotes and exploring a lot of different options in um, the, the marketplace right now. Um, it, it's just difficult. There is one broker that's out there. K, K Insurance, I'm sure many of you have heard of them, who are really the, the industry leader in this and who um, insures, I believe it's 50 to 53 of the 55 state associations. It's, it's almost all of them out there. So uh, we're exploring a lot of different options also with our uh, account manager here uh, locally as well. So uh, we've also uh, met with USYS. We, we are bound by USYS policy, their risk management policy, to carry a certain amount of uh, liability coverage. We're uh, meeting with them to ask if there would be any type of flexibility in that. Uh, we never want to carry less insurance, but uh, we're, we're balancing that with what our premiums are going to be going forward. Uh, to combat the, the problems that we've been having and the claims, we've transitioned, as I'm sure many of you know, to a new background check provider, uh, JDP or JD Palantine. 
a much more thorough background check than uh, we had previously done hits on some places that, that we uh, previously didn't and uh, should ultimately identify, help identify people who, were, um, who, who shouldn't be working with our members. Uh, we, we've now mandated uh, international background checks, um, international being people who aren't a citizen who, or who don't have a social security number. Uh, we, we are now having them do background checks from their uh, uh, country of uh, citizenship. So that, that's been a, a major, major thing that, that we've added to our repertoire and background checking also through uh, JDP. Uh, you'll, you'll be seeing a lot more of this coming out, but uh, just uh, recently, last month, <coughs> FYSA has um, uh, committed to a relationship with uh, Presidium. Uh, Presidium is really the industry leader in abuse prevention and uh, protection of youth, uh, um, youth participants. Uh, I, and I say that purposely because their uh, scope is well beyond soccer. They've worked with the Boy Scouts of America they have worked with soccer organizations, uh, other state associations uh, that are out there. They, they've worked with uh, a USA uh, Swimming, uh, a number of different youth serving organizations. So we are really excited to embrace their uh, pathway to accreditation, they call it. In the insurance business, in the youth serving market, the Presidium accreditation means an awful lot. They come in, they review our policies, they recommend changes, they, um, they, they help us implement changes, they, they do individual uh, trainings if they, if they need it. Uh, FYSA is committed to this and, and it's not gonna be an easy process. You guys will be hearing uh, about Presidium and, and some of the, the new policies that we are putting in place because of our relationship with them. And uh, Eric is gonna talk a little bit on uh, administrative costs and controls. Yeah, so, so, you know, the things that we've touched on so far as far as uh, refunds for the competitions and then also the fee increase and the uh, substantial insurance increase, right? So if you add all of that up, right, it's a sub substantial financial consequence to FYSA, right? Um, somewhere estimated for the insurance about 400000 and probably more than $400,000 for the uh, competition refunds. And both of those are the right thing to do, right? So while we're having financial impact, so are all of you and so are all of the families. And so the thought is the more we can absorb of that and keep the impact low, that's really our goal, right? So even though we're expecting numbers to go down a bit, we want to keep as many people playing and make it as affordable as possible. And so that's really our goal, right? And, and we're behind that. We're putting our money where our mouth is to the tune of nearly a million dollars, right? So I think the board is firmly committed to making sure we do that. And, and another step in that process, aside from you know strategically using reserves, um, which again is all of your money, it's the money from our organizations. Um, we're also cutting costs, right? So a few years ago, we implemented a robust financial policies and procedures. It included um, all of our reimbursements as well as even limits and caps on meals and things like that. So um, at the direction of John, we've taken a look at those. And uh, last Friday, we voted in an update, um, our first update in about two years and we slashed those even further, right? So um, we, we made added in prohibitions for things like alcohol. We cut the amount that any of the meals are capped at um, to even lower values. And, and believe me, they were not outrageous to begin with. Um, and so, you, you, you know, you can rest assured that the sorts of things that your families are doing are the sorts of things that we'll be doing. So we're tightening our belt. Um, we've also reduced our mileage reimbursements and a number of different things. So we're we're doing our part not only by absorbing some of these costs, but also by trying to reduce the cost that we have um, between all of our volunteers and staff. Um, and uh, John or Joel, I don't know if there's any other specific cuts that you want to speak to, um, but but those are really the big ones. And we took a comprehensive look at it, um, and and we're we're really trying to cut costs wherever we can. Uh, just uh, to tag on, Eric, uh, you know, in addition to the financial policies, we have several of our board members will be working with the staff to evaluate some programs, uh, look at our um, both revenues and expenses for those programs, and seek to um, you know, essentially balance things out. Um, we, you know, we very much feel like that there are opportunities uh, for us to bring our, our administrative costs down 
Uh, we have we are a blessed organization. We have been fortunate to have reserves, um, and we continue to have reserves. We did take, you know, we we have investments, and and as everybody out there, uh, if you have an investment account, you've taken a hit through the market. We have as well, um, but we still stand uh, stand in a position to be able to support both support these refunds, support absorbing these uh, these costs that we think are coming, uh, the additional cost for the insurance this uh, that will come out this summer, uh, but we also are not going to just, we're not looking to seek to close the budget gap on the backs of our members. We are uh, looking at anything and everything. Um, the board uh, will be meeting on May 30th and we will be, uh, be, be evaluating some ideas, uh, some plans that will be put in place. So uh, on that note, I'd like to go to the last slide before we open it up to questions. Um, and this really does talk about kind of the future. So, John, oh, I'm sorry, a I jumped. More it. Notes here. <laughs> Go ahead, Joel. Sorry. Actually, I think Eric's going to start with this one. Go ahead. Yeah. So, a little bit about the insurance, right? So, we walk through what our return to play plan looks like, right? It it starts with practices and then opens up to tryouts, games, and uh, a more normal feeling um, sort of thing. Um, but things to keep in mind, right? While we're during the suspension, there are no insurance policies covering you, right? So if you choose to ignore the suspension and you go out and start playing tomorrow and someone is injured, our insurance will absolutely not cover that, right? That will rest solely on you. So it's important that you follow these things. They are not recommendations. They are absolutely mandates. Um, and our insurance will not cover them as a result of that. Um, so something to understand our participant accident insurance, think of it like the secondary medical coverage, it does not apply to illnesses or infectious disease, right? So that's the insurance that if you normally break your leg or tear your ACL, anything like that, and you don't have medical insurance, right? The family doesn't have medical insurance or needs additional medical coverage, you submit a form to our office, it goes through our insurance carrier, and we cover that for you. Um, that does not apply to infectious disease, which would include COVID-19. The FYSA general liability policy um, provides club liability coverage for bodily injury, which does include bodily injury, sickness, or disease. Um, and so it does not contain a communicable disease exclusion, um, which means there is coverage there. But the crucial thing to understand here is it is not the same as our accident coverage. A player cannot just file a claim through our office to have their medical bill covered under the general liability policy, right? It only cover, covers club or FYSA liability. So what does that mean practically speaking? That means if a, a player alleges that someone is negligent or some other legal theory, and that is what caused them to get COVID-19, this would cover that sort of um, situation. But it does not cover just, hey, I got COVID-19. I think it may have happened during an FYSA sanctioned event and I want you to pay my medical bill. It does not cover it in that same way. So it's very clear you need to, you know, make sure that no one is submitting those claims to our office because they will be denied. There is no coverage for that. Um, and, and just a final note, right? Like everything else, as you use it, they take it away. So you can expect, right, there hasn't been a pandemic in over 100 years at this scale. And um, so while those policies currently include things like that, they likely will not in the future. Um, and that's not a result of any claims. That's just a result of, you know, insurance companies don't cover things that they don't have to because they are there to make a profit. Yeah, um, just to echo what Eric said, I just I really want to uh, reaffirm to everybody that top point that um, during our mandated suspension of play until phase three starts in the, in the state of Florida, uh, none of our insurance policies are applicable right now. Going back to what Eric said about the liability, though, in, in the case that um, a suit could be brought forward, um, the, the board put a lot of consideration into the liability of when we return to play, because that's when those lawsuits could potentially come forward is in those first couple of weeks of play. So that, that, that influenced a lot of the decision making that the board made what was to ensure that um, we were compliant with uh, the, uh, all laws that, that we saw out there. So uh, just as that last point, I've had multiple, multiple conference calls with our insurance providers, our, our broker, 
Um, I, I have a lot of information on this, so please direct any specific questions because as we all know with insurance, it's rarely cut and dry. So I, I may be able to answer some more specific questions, but this was, was a good uh, general overview that uh, I hope all the members um, will, will take to heart as they're evaluating their, their own uh, potential return to play decisions. Hey, Joel. Um, yes. The, um, I know we've, we've talked about it and I know that there's, uh, there's guidance coming from various places. Uh, can you touch on you know, what we're doing to prepare uh, for, to give clubs guidance regarding return to play when, it, when they do, are allowed to take the field? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we will have uh, recommendations for FYSA return to play guidelines. Uh, the, the board hasn't uh, quite tackled those yet. Uh, as a staff, we're starting to put together the, um, the, the type of information that will be helpful to you guys. There, there have been things thrown out uh, about sanitizing the balls after every use, eliminating the handshakes, um, not allowing trainings of more than 10 people. That, that, that's when we're talking about that two week gap where you're not allowed to return to full play. Um, th these are examples of what other um, state associations and other sports are implementing. We have um, received so much information, uh, credit to our board for being very proactive out there about looking at what other sports are doing. We've seen things from rugby to lacrosse to, to football, and we're, we're sort of just aggregating all of that information. Uh, we'll make a presentation to the board uh, by this month. Uh, conservative or um, best case scenario, we can kind of start that uh, two week span sometime in June. So you, I, I'm committed to getting that information out at least a couple weeks to our members of uh, return to play best practices, I would call it, uh, at least a couple weeks before it goes out. So it's in work right now. We're, we're really just gathering as much information as we can and uh, seeing what we uh, w what will work best for our members here in Florida. Thank you, Joel. Oh, we're ready. Okay, so so what's next? Um, some have asked about the annual general meeting. Um, it is currently scheduled for the August seven through nine. Uh, it would be it is scheduled at the JW Marriott uh, Grand Lakes, Orlando. Um, we have uh, the other night we authorized a special committee made up of um, I think it's uh, four three or four board members and two staff members to um, really evaluate our options. Uh, we have already already put in place with the hotel, uh, we've already given them notice that you know, there's a possibility we won't be able to go through with, our, uh, with the AGM on site, uh, but that decision ha doesn't have to be made and, and we don't have, we're not on the hook until uh, early June, but we don't wanna wait that, uh, truly don't wait, wanna wait that long. Uh, by May 30th, uh, we will have a plan that will be presented to the board and we will then communicate that out. Um, there are there are way too many options for me to get into them tonight. Just know that um, you know we're looking at everything, uh, and we will uh, communicate it as soon as we know. Um, rule change proposals they're due May 11th. Um, that is five days from now. Uh, so if there is if there are some FYSA rules or bylaws that you believe uh, need to change. Uh, I encourage you to um, go to the website, uh, click on the AGM link, and there is a, a rule change amendment form. It's electronic. There's a link there right under the AGM, um, on the AGM page. Uh, click on it, fill it out. It looks just like those in the past. You tell us what rule you want to change, what, it's, what it says now, what, it would, what you want it to say, and what your justification is. Um, once those are collected, uh, they will be sent to the Rules Committee. Uh, for for review, uh, rules committee will uh, seek, if necessary, to reconcile uh, similar rule changes. Uh, you, talk, you know, working with the uh, the proposer of the amendments, and then they will um, make recommendations on those specific changes. And then 30 days, no, not no later than 30 days prior to the AGM, the rules committee will publish those for the membership to re review and evaluate. Um, and then finally, um, this year, as every year, uh, this is an election year, of course, and so nominations um, are available on the website as well. Um, and and all, so all that's happening. 
regional eight annual general meetings, um, you know, we've we always uh, usually have, well, we always have these um, spread between June and July. Um, and it's an opportunity for the members in that region to come together uh, to not only uh, to hear from FYSA leaders, uh, but also to, you know, conduct uh, regional commissioner elections and just, you know, generally, you know, work, get together and, and talk about soccer and, and the organization of. Uh, this year, um, the regional annual meetings will not be in-person events. Uh, all regional vice presidents have agreed that they will do virtual um, regional AGMs. Uh, it's not uh, it's not optimal, uh, but it is uh, a way that we can still connect with our regional members uh, and and uh, not uh, just cancel them all together. Uh, dates are going to be developed. The regional vice presidents are working on. Uh, a proposal that they will bring to the board. Uh, we have a May 19th uh, conference call. I hope that we'll have that um, that those details finalized and we'll be able to share that with the membership um, sooner than later. Oh, so we've we shared a lot um, tonight. I'm going to go ahead and um, first of all, I want to say not only thank you to you guys that joined, but also uh, a, a big thank you to both Joel and Eric. Um, I, I I think the number of emails we've exchanged and text messages we've exchanged in the last uh, last five or last week uh, has there. I, I couldn't count them right now. Um, we we are we are putting in a lot of time to try to make sure that we button this thing up uh, as best we can. We don't have perfect answers. Uh, and Joel, while I'm talking, if you would jump back to the slide that talks about the return to play, um, if you would, that's that's a hot topic on the comments, uh, the chat section. Um, but, you know, thank you to both Eric and Joel and, and Joel's doing you know, a great job. I don't know if you guys um, can imagine starting a job in January. Uh, first of all, being you know, told, hey, by the way, insurance uh, is is an issue. We need to deal with risk management. And then COVID comes along. So he has had a, an extremely interesting first five months. Um, I hope that once we're through this, that we get a bit of uh, calm seas. Uh, so that he's able to uh, really get himself uh, into the role. He had desired to get out and meet uh, as many clubs as possible over the first 90 to 120 days. He wasn't able to accomplish that. Um, COVID-19 certainly uh, put that uh, out of reach for him. Uh, but I know he he stands ready to you know, have conversations with anybody. Uh, he is uh, He is the best person to contact if you have questions. Um, please feel free to go to him. Um, so this is the slide that has been asked for a couple of different times. Uh, just to reiterate for those that came in late, uh, our, our return to play will uh, be triggered by the uh, move to phase three as ordered by Governor DeSantis. Um, on the date that phase three is effective, there will be a two week period in which only practices are permitted. Uh, beyond that, uh, there will be no games and no other sanctioned activity. Two weeks from the start of phase three, uh, organizations will be allowed to start offering games, conduct tryouts, and do everything that, that they would normally do. Um, there's a couple of questions. One question came up um, in the chat box about when's the last day to play games. So it's a bit interesting, right? Our rules, um, sometimes they, they are very clear, other times they're a little bit muddled. In this case, the seasonal year technically doesn't end until August 31. That's our, our seasonal year is so September 1 to August 31. Insurance, however, renews on August 1st. Registrations are effective August 1st. So, um, Mike Hyatt, I'm gonna I'm gonna just I'm gonna put a date out there, and then I will if if I I'll take it back to the board, and if, if I find out something different, we'll certainly correct this uh, before we start to play any games. But I think for all practical purposes, July 31 is the last time to play under the rosters for this year. Uh, I think by that point, the day that that very next day, all the rosters reset to 2020/21 rosters, and so uh, I think that is the practical date is July 31. Um, and again, if I if my board members and experts correct me, we would be certain to circle back with the whole group. Um, okay. First question. Go ahead, Joel. Was that so? Uh, okay. Um, first question we have. Uh, so you keep saying about money. Uh, this is, uh, I think it's Joe. Um, 
Jose uh, about awards and gifts. Uh, where are those awards and gifts? Um, so, and are they going to be able to use be able to use for next year? It's actually a mixed bag. Um, the costs aren't just you know awards and gifts. There's there's you know just the time the staff spent planning the events, the you know having to to secure sites because everything was expected to go forward, especially President's Cup. We actually had events, and so we had costs, travel costs, staffing costs that went into that. Um, some of what we purchased this year will certainly, you know, hopefully we can use some of it. I think some of the awards actually have dates written on them. So, you know, unless, I think unless members were happy getting a 2020, a 2020 um, champions medal for their 2021 State Cup or President's Cup, we probably can't reuse that kind of stuff. Um, so there's, there's a lot that goes into that, um, that calculation. It's not just, you know, uh, stuff that we can simply reuse. Um, Dave uh, with Braden River asked how many reckoned competitive players we have. I posted in the chat box this year uh, as of to, as of last week, I think, which I don't believe we've gotten any more given the shutdown. Uh, rec, we had 46,845 competitive, 47,383. Tops players, 1,041 for a total of 95,269. Um, Last year, we registered a total of around 103,000 players uh, with the spring season and the, the registrations we did not get this, this spring. I think we could have, could have gotten to 100,000, maybe 101, um, so not too far off from last year's numbers. Uh, however, I truly, unless everything gets back on the field and we have a lot of players uh, in the, that want to play some summer soccer, unless those registrations come in, we probably won't won't go much higher than what we're at today. Uh, and these sub, these numbers are not verified. They're not final. It just happens to be the, the numbers we're operating off of. So I want to make sure you all are aware. Um, Jose also asked about um, how many clubs <coughs> have had claims against them. I, I'll be honest, it's more than one. It's less than 20, but I, I'm not comfortable going into details uh, or even going much further into the discussion on these things. Uh, they are sensitive matters. I, I simply, I will not address uh, specific clubs. Um, and just, I, I can say with certainty, it is not a single club. There are multiples and, um, you know, we have seen an increase. I think it's an, an important thing to to realize too. I actually was looking through some old, an, e an old email from last year. Our, our um, rate history with our insurance uh, back in 2009 was in was around five dollars a player. It had floated down to around four dollars and twenty cents a player. It was you know a little bit of adjustment here and there. In my time with FYSA, uh, this is the, the the largest increase that we've seen. This is also a period of time in which we have seen the greatest number of claims filed, um, especially on the general liability side, guys. Um, we have to we collectively have to clean up. Um, any area where we may be lax in our registrations. If you you or or you know of a club, anybody who is is somehow just you know deciding to hey it's okay to not register that that coach or that manager for some reason if they think that's okay, they it's not okay. Um, every every opportunity that folks have to slip through our our net uh, with our risk management, it opens us up to to liability. And as we've seen, uh, one the action of a of a small group of people can have a massive impact on the larger organization. And it's not lost on us that we have to do everything we can to educate you. We um, we are doing that through Presidium. Presidium is going to not only tell us where we have holes in our review process, they're also going to assist us with designing policies that we can then ask you to follow. And it's not because we want to be, you know, put some onerous burden on you. It truly is to protect the entirety of, of this organization, all 220 plus clubs. Um, it, is, it is our desire that these things that we're putting in place uh, will um, sway the, the insurance companies to not raise fees to the extent that they've estimated. Um, but it is, it is certainly a possibility. And, and so we want to do everything we can to get ahead of it. And to Joel's credit, he's been communicating with them on, on a, a frequent basis to try to make sure they know everything we're doing. Uh, Graham, 
we've we've posted that back up julie uh mask while playing uh scp we we don't know um and that will be there'll be more to come on that as we get guidance from both usu soccer and as we synthesize information from various sources um so more to come on that um Eric Vasquez, are we taking into consideration different counties that have extended closure? Um, we we have, um, Eric, and our challenge is that um, if one or if we if we were to wait for every organ every county to decide it was okay to return to play to, and held everybody back, um, on one side it isn't fair to the to the club that is affected by the the extended shutdown within their county. But it's it's probably, frankly, more unfair to impose that same restriction on the other 220 clubs. It, it's not an easy question or an answer. I, I don't I do not like it one bit uh, that we don't have a single person, say the governor, giving an up or down um, guidance on this. He is simply going to say when phase three starts, and that will be the date that we go that we get started. Now we did say a majority of counties, so. In the unlikely event that he were to say, hey, only 30 of 67 counties can be in phase three, then we haven't met that tr that threshold. We have not met the majority of. So today it's 64 out of 67. Um, I suspect that those 64 counties will stay on the same timeline and that some counties uh, locally, regardless of the governor's guidance, may say you can't play. Um, but there is no way, honestly, for, for FYSA to be able to uh, address that short of requiring that there be a hundred percent access before anybody can play and um, I, I I don't believe that's um, that's prudent nor do I think it would be um, uh, be acceptable by a majority of our membership we have guidance on the change in waivers release of liability um, we don't we know that uh, insurance uh, provider the insurance company when they do the quote they will propose amendments to our coverage and we'll know more than probably what 30 to 60 days before August 1. Uh, we'll communicate well, those John, changes. Uh, yes, sir. I, I think what they mean is the releases that players sign at the beginning, like about if you get hurt and oh, things like that. Um, sure. But I think your answer still holds. I think our answer is no, that's something that you should seek legal counsel on. Um, yeah. And and really, to be honest, the best way to protect yourself is just to take all reasonable precautions that a prudent person would and to follow the guidance of the government. Um, Danny Pranat, yes, um, players would stay their same age until August 1. So if they're U15 this, uh, today, they would be U15 until, uh, up and until July 31st. Uh, they would become U16 on August 1st. Um, does FYSA have event insurance for their events? Um, so, Olaf, it's interesting. When you say event insurance, usually that is about, I'm, I'm, are you going talking about cancellation insurance? Because if you are, I, I can say categorically, we do not purchase um, insurance to cover in the event of cancellation uh, to protect ourselves from uh, these types of, of scenarios. Um, in the 40, what, 40, four years, 45 years of FYSA. I think this probably, I can safely say, this is the first time that we've had to cancel entire cups. As a result, we always have rain dates. We always get these games in. So this is a first, and I, I don't think anybody could, in, with, a, with a straight face, say that they, we could have predicted that we needed to pay for insurance. Uh, so no, we don't. Um, can you make these slides available at the presentation? Yes, Tony, we will, along with a, um, a recorded version of this uh, of this whole of the, the meeting. What are we doing about the two to twenty that are costing us increased insurance costs? Um, well, it, it's not the clubs costing us; it's the it's the actions of the individuals. And so, if an individual um, is subject to a safe sport complaint, for example, we have guidelines. We suspend them immediately. Um, if there's actions that they take that um, need to be dis, uh, have further discipline, expulsion, um, susp uh, further suspension, what have you, that's that's what we do. Um, clubs do not, we do not sanction individual clubs for the actions of their members. Now, 
that said, that's that doesn't preclude you know, fully preclude that from uh, us from taking some action. But I think that's that goes to some questions and some conversations around, um, you know, what is club culture? What what is the what did the club know? Did they you know, was it did they do did they do something that made them liable? Um, we will be the guidelines we're going to be coming out with the new policies and stuff. We're going to be expecting people to comply. If you don't comply with our policies, there will be consequences. Uh, so it will be more related to your ability as a club to put into place those required uh, processes and those required uh, policies that we ask you to put in to protect the whole, right? Um, Danny, yeah, John, uh, rumors? John, if, if I, oh, go ahead, Joel. I'm going to, both yeah, of you, yeah. yes, please. To buddy on to that, uh, that, that's a lot of what we're going to be working with uh, Presidium on is, is is a challenge of ours and a challenge of any large association is getting information, filtering it down to the ultimate, uh, the, the, the person who truly needs it. Um, at times, we, we're a bit disconnected from players and individual coaches and our conduit is the club. I, I think that we have some room for improvement on conveying our messages to the club to reach to the ultimate coach. So we're, we're tackling issues like that via policy, via our partnership with Presidium, uh, via the trainings that, that we're all forced to do, and, and then ensuring compliance with it. It's all part of the larger risk management um, package that um, we're going to be uh, rolling out that, that we're gonna be looking to improve. Eric? Yeah, and I was going to say something similar to Joel, right, is Presidium is what we're doing immediately, right? We we enacted that in April, and aside from that, we've enacted the safe sport training that's mandatory for every adult um, that has to pass a background check. Um, and uh, as John mentioned, right, so if there's clubs that are not following those safe sport guidelines, um, for instance, you know about an instance of sexual abuse against a child and you don't report it, yes, we would then do something about the club, right? But if the club is doing everything we're asking them to, they promptly report upon knowing about it. You don't necessarily want to punish every member of the club for, you know, a, a single person's action. Um, and I would also add that last year we adopted a, a sexual harassment and abuse policy um, that is out on our website. So we've done several things to try to address that behavior and it's going to get more and more aggressive, right? So under the safe sport policies and things, there's certain policies that may um, already exist that say, for instance, if you're a coach, you cannot have any child that's uh, a part of that club in your vehicle unless they are your child, right? So any player on your team, if you're caught doing that, you will be absolutely suspended. It doesn't matter if there's no allegation of abuse and absolutely nothing happened. Just the mere fact of you putting yourself and a child in a situation where something could have happened will be a punishable behavior. And that is how we're gonna start rooting these things out. We're gonna punish any situation where you put yourself in a one-on-one -on -one situation with a player where there is potential for abuse. And there will be absolutely no sympathy for the fact that nothing occurred. If you put yourself and a player at risk by having a one-on-one -on -one interaction that cannot be interrupted and observed by others, which are the guidelines by Safe Score, you will absolutely be punished and severely. So moving to the next question, uh, Danny uh, Pranat uh, mentions a rumor about clubs being on separate insurance. Uh, we are working with our insurance provider to uh, have coverage for all members of FYSA. That is our, our stated goal. And, uh, and for now, that what you're mentioning is simply a rumor. Um, Graham, copy a PowerPoint, what, later today, probably tomorrow, Joel? Yeah, first thing Thank tomorrow. You. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, what is the board doing about clubs that are violating F bylaws and costs? So, same question. Um, Tom, if you're aware of people violating bylaws, uh, you, you have the authority or the, the, I guess, the privilege, the maybe the duty even, uh, to file those charges. Um, we don't know about it. We certainly can't take action on it, but we do have processes that need to be followed. Uh, South Florida will see long wait for phase three and when it's authorized. Uh, so I totally uh, John, agree. I just want to go back to one one comment yep. that Tom made right about his questions, where he says, "What is the board doing, not us members?" I think we should all remember when we're talking about the major driver of these insurance increases, it's sexual assault of minors, of children, right? 
And aside from insurance, it's a, it's a much more serious issue, right? So if those allegations are true and those people are being sexually assaulted at a young age, it essentially ruins their entire life, right? They will absolutely never be the same. So I, I think the question to say that it's about only what the board is doing um, doesn't truly understand the problem with, that we're dealing with. And 19 people or 11 staff members at a state office cannot be on every single field, right? And so we actually, we need the help of our members and it has to be a collective effort because you guys are the ones that are out on your field Saturday and you're the ones that are gonna know if, hey, some coach is violating the rules and going into the restroom with players or something like that, right? We can't see that sort of activity. So it's really not just about what the board is doing. We can put guidelines in, but we need all of your help to make this happen. And, and truthfully, if we have even a single member club that's not willing to help, as we've seen by this, just a few actions can cause a significant increase as far as financial costs, but really the cost to a kid's life and what it's going to be like literally for the next 60 or 80 years that they're alive, right? They have to live with that. And so if the members aren't willing to help us, we will never see a reduction in cost. And it has to be a collective effort of every single member, every single parent, and every single coach. And that's why we have this safe sport training to try to show you what are the signs that you need to be aware of, right? This type of behavior usually happens leading up to these sorts of things so that you can recognize it and help us. But it, it truly is not about the board. It's about all of us really as human beings. And hopefully COVID-19 has shown us, you know, how we need to come together as humans and, and really protect children. Costs aside, we don't want these things to happen to any child. And so I think every member, including the board, which is very committed, we all need to be doing this, right? And if there's a single one of us that's not, then you should probably just not reaffiliate next year. Thanks, Eric. So Lee Levenberg, um, you, you, you reiterate the concern about uh, the, the disparity for some clubs that are, may not be allowed to return as along with everyone else. We share your concern. I, we, we debated it. Um, we really feel like the best thing we can do is, is um, allow the majority of clubs to return when they're, when they're able to, uh, based on the phase three start. Um, I would encourage you to, to direct your questions to and, and uh, petition your local authorities to open up you know, sooner than later, if at all possible. Uh, but as a state organization, we, we certainly would not be right for, for me to hold back teams in, in Tampa, Orlando, Jacksonville, uh, because South Florida or one, or one locale in South Florida decides they want to wait until September or October. Um, I, think you, I think you would agree that that would be an impractical application. Admin, I'm not sure what you're saying about cups and what, why teams wouldn't be able to move up. They certainly can, they're eight, they will advance in age. Um, if you're saying that by winning the cup that they would then, if they won President's Cup, they'd move to State Cup. Um, there's no, there's nothing that limits a team from, from uh, applying for state cup as long as they get their league games, um, they can play in state cup. So we do not artificially require teams to perform uh, at a certain level in, um, in the state or presidents or commissioners cup, uh, and we don't use that as a criteria for next year. Um, Olaf, uh, it's fair to assume there will be another player fee increase. Um, that will be a decision for next uh, next uh, April. I'm sure the discussion will be had by that uh, the board uh, to determine what's going to happen with fees for next year. Um, we are, in a way, we're doing, we're, we're sort of recapturing what happened, but that's the information that we have available to us. And so um, I think that's a fair assumption that there will probably be another fee increase, uh, but we're going to work very hard to uh, mitigate that uh, as best we can. Um, about clubs not registering all their kids with FYSA, there is no requirement, Tom, to register all players with FYSA. The requirement is that they re be registered with uh, the federation. And so as long as you can be a club and you literally can register some players with AYSO, some with FYSA, some with U.S. clubs, some with U.S.S.A., as long as all players are registered with the Federation through one of the Federation members, the organization members, then you are in compliance with Federation bylaws. FYSA, uh, years ago, there was a, uh, I believe there was a lawsuit when organizations like FYSA um, in the early 2000s, I think it was, about the time U.S. Club came along, 
they tried. They said, hey, you know, you have to register 100% of your players with FYSA or you can't be a member. Uh, the Federation nixed that. They passed policy 212, I believe it was, uh, Joel. Shake your head. Yeah, 212. Yeah. I think it is. And basically they said you can't require 100% register with your organization. You can require that they register with your organization in order to participate in your programs. So a, a, a U.S. club team cannot apply to state cup. Uh, just as a U.S. club t or a, a U.S. or an FYSA team can't apply to U.S. clubs state competition or U.S. club leagues. Our leagues are different. Tournaments were also adjudicated by the Federation. If there is an unrestricted tournament, that tournament is open to all Federation members, but you have to be a Federation member. So that's kind of that, that deal. So we do not have a bylaw that says 100% must be registered with us. We do require they be registered with all federation with a federation member. If you are aware that someone is not, then again, there are mechanisms and processes for you to file um, and bring that to our attention. Um, Tom, to clarify, what is FYSA board doing? Not us as members. I think that's been addressed. Player in one county that is in phase three and lives in the county that is, that is in phase two. Julie, I think it's based on the, where the club's home fields are. If the club is allowed to do it, I don't think anybody's checking. Uh, ad addresses at that at that park. I would refer, however, you to your local authorities. They may have some restrictions around that, but that is not an FYSA issue. Uh, why didn't we cancel Cup sooner? Um, frankly, admin, we 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 hoped to uh, get kids back on the field, and and we you know this stuff's been changing as you you've been watching the news, same as us. We we had uh, we were hoping for the best, but we've been as you can see tonight's. Um, uh, refunds and, and our processes, these things took some time for us to put into place. So we have been thinking about what it looks like to cancel for quite some time. Uh, we did not feel that it was appropriate to make the decision um, until last evening. And why did DA close business? We have no idea. That's a federation deal. Um, for clarity, on May 18th, can we reach out and have players outside our club commit? Yes, you can. Um, Will there be a surprise bylaw? <laughs> no, Tom, there won't be surprises. Uh, rule changes are required to be submitted by May 11th. Uh, last year, uh, we submitted as a board, we submitted the entire rule rewrite prior to May 11th. We actually submitted it to the Rules Committee in time. So this year, if there's nothing submitted to the Rules Committee by May 11th, there will be no August surprise, if you will. So rest assured that we are we are going to follow uh, timelines just as we did last year. Um, May unemployed coaches are interviewed and offered jobs now if their club is no longer paying them. So coaches can be um, contacted uh, as early as March 1st. That's in the rules. We've we've had that um, that rule in there for a couple of years. So um, so the answer, Seth, is unemployed or otherwise, they're permitted to talk to um, new clubs after March 1. Uh, where's uh, individuals that have been suspended by leagues? Um, I did, I don't know. Joel, can you take that one offline perhaps and follow up? Yeah, definitely. Thing? Thank you. Yeah, uh, I mean, if he's touching on risk management issues there, that's all obviously handled in Got Soccer. The, the club who would try to register somebody, they'd show up as uh, denied in there. They, they wouldn't be able to roster them. So Brian Hernandez asked if U.S. club goes back to play before our timeline and their member clubs start holding trials. Don't you think more clubs will go back under them? I do think that that is a slight risk, Brian. But if the CDC and the govern, governor's uh, phased approach is saying that it's not safe for teams to be back on the field and U.S. club chooses to put clubs and players at risk, then frankly, shame on them. Other than the insurance risk management issue, can you clarify if there's a stated sanction that a club would receive if the club held practices or tryouts prior to the state of return to play? I cannot, Bill. Um, it, it would, it's going to have, it would actually, I'm going to have to defer that. We don't, I don't know. I hope that people will, will abide by the guidelines and by the mandate. Um, if someone does not, they're subject to their neighbor. Um, bringing charges against them or citing or bringing it to our attention and, and we will 
I have to take uh, take it into consideration and, and make a decision. Probably refer it to the review and discipline committee. Quite frankly, yes, Joel. Obviously, this is outside of uh, regular rule violations, so there's not going to be anything that we can point to within the rules and regulations that would. Um, show how long of a suspension or how long of a sanction that that might be there. But but again, I would go back to what we talked about on the insurance issue that that that, that club, if they do uh, ignore our mandate, uh, our mandated suspension, they are putting themselves and the players at a great risk. Our, our insurance will not apply basically until uh, we, we meet, uh, we enter phase three as we've outlined here. So it, it's, it, they would be taking a larger risk than most likely what we could sanction them with. Uh, Mike Andrews, thank you for your comment. Um, your regional vice president, your regional commissioners are absolutely the, a great person to connect with and share your thoughts. Uh, we are having the next board conference call is May 19th. Uh, we will have a board meeting on May 30th, and I'll just more breaking. One thing I will mention is the board also agreed last night that the May 30th meeting will be a Saturday morning. Uh, we will be um, we are working on a solution to be able to uh, stream that live on Facebook. Uh, so we're hoping to to allow for the membership to um, get a peek behind the curtain, if you will, and and see you know, some of the things we're talking about and dealing with. So more to come on that. Um, Tom, uh, it's belaboring the, the point, Tom. I, I don't want to continue down that path right now, man. I hear what you're saying. Um, again, if you have issues, uh, if you have concerns, if you have, com if you have charges you want to file, please you, you know, avail yourself of the process. Thank you, Mike Hyatt. Uh, Tony, thank you. Eric, got you. Um, if Stan family states we didn't file training at the same levels as if COVID did not occur, they have a case to say they should not have to pay remaining owed fees. That is the, the decision or the, the matter between the club and the player, the player of the fees really is a legal matter. Uh, there is the not in good standing uh, say, uh, section of the Florida, of our FYSA uh, rules that was passed by the membership. Um, frankly, it it gives the the club power in that relationship to uh, hold that player uh, and keep them from registering with uh, another member uh, until whatever financial obligations are satisfied. Um, this is a unique case, and so I would just say, as president, not a, this is not an official policy. This is me saying I would hope that clubs would be understanding that there are circumstances beyond just the fact that somebody doesn't want to pay you. So I hope. And we talked about this a bit earlier today. I hope we won't see a quadrupling or a, a, a 10 times the number of not in good standings uh, coming into the office between now and May 22nd. I would hope that clubs and, and parents are able to come to terms and, and come up with a, a, an agreeable sol a resolution to their, their differences. Um, when do we anticipate to have guidelines for a return completed by? Uh, Joel, are we thinking by May 30? Oh, uh, cer certainly well before then. I, I would guess in the next uh, week to two. Again, it's really just about uh, working with the board. So you, you could probably call it uh, by the May 19th board meeting at the latest if we can't get something accomplished uh, via email. Uh, it, it's just about gathering all this information. So I, I would certainly think before May 30th. Tom, your FYSA bylaw 102.13 does say 100% of players. So 100% of players that participate in our programs have to be registered with FYSA. The Federation, go look at bylaw two, or not bylaw, um, policy 212, um, uh, Federation policy 212 will uh, clearly states that we're not allowed to require 100% of players to be registered with us. Organizations, clubs can mix and match their registrations with various Federation members. Player got red carded, all the suspensions carry over to next season. Yes, because uh, they haven't served those games. Um, U.S. club soccer is being responsible as FYSA, as FYSA in the management of this crisis. Is that, I'm thinking that's a statement one. Uh, I refer, I defer to, I don't know. Uh, if U.S. club soccer tells people they can be back on the field before phase three, I personally don't think that's the responsible approach. Um, but 
if you believe that they're being responsible, by all means, uh, that is your that can, that's your opinion. Point being, what if club followed social distance guidelines that was allowed by city government to hold practice prior to phase three and had insurance that does cover them? Bill, if people take if you take the field before phase three starts, it, FYSA insurance will not apply. That includes any any claims that arise as a result of injury or any claims that result or ri arise from the uh, general liability. The challenge you have with having your own insurance to cover you in that case is the, frankly, the, the, the good attorneys won't see it that way. They're going to name us, they're gonna name your club, and because our policy is even out there, we're going to get sucked into that. I would, I would ask, I would, well, we are mandating that no play can occur, no practices, nothing can occur on fields until at least the start of phase three. Currently look, looking to be potentially June 1st. It may be earlier. If, if Governor DeSantis comes out tomorrow and says, we're gonna do a week at a time, it may, we may be able to open, the, open things up earlier than, uh, sooner than later. Um, that would be a, a refreshing change from his current approach, but uh, he is, he's doing what he has to do. Uh, we have four minutes left, and I'm going to continue to read these guys. Um, uh, tournaments can play over the summer. A tournament can, they can apply to, to host tournaments over the summer, yes. Um, uh, when it's tryouts, 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 tryouts uh, can be no sooner than 14, 14 days or two weeks after the start of phase three, ad admin. When did rec players go up by more than 30% in three years and comp less than 15% aren't most of the claims from the comp members? Uh, well, one of those dollars, um, first of all, the net cost, um, Tom, to your point, we do, we have FYSA bucks still in effect. And uh, I expect that the, that the board will continue to have FYSA bucks. It's my hope that they will. Um, so we give back $2 of the, um, of the fee. Um, but, uh, we, we weighed and balanced everything out um, from a, a raw dollar standpoint. They're going up $4, your uh, rec is going up three. Uh, we, we did not look at it on a percentage basis. Uh, phase three is uh, June 1st. We hope j phase three is June 1st. We're not entirely sure. Um, that is, uh, the, the phases are set up in two weeks, uh, 14 day segments. And so right now we're in phase one. Uh, May 18th would start phase two if all goes to plan. June 1st would start phase three. Uh, pay attention to the governor's actions. If the governor comes out with a with a change in the, the cadence of those um, phases, we will abide and follow his lead. Um, it is a statement. Um, they are not regarding any safety procedures at this point. Fair enough, one to regard. But I'm going to go ahead and go there. And I'm just going to say this. Eric, Joel, apologize in advance. But if you are a U.S. club member, I would challenge you to ask your U.S. club representative and why or whether or not they run background checks on coaches every single year and whether they actually pull the FDLE level one background check as required by Florida statute. I can assure you that Florida State, uh, the Florida Youth Soccer Association absolutely pulls that, that uh, background check and it gets pulled by, by our risk management uh, company, JDP. It costs $24 per year just for the FDLE check. The other $9 is paid uh, for administrative support from our, our risk management, and then there's a portion that is does go toward administrative costs within the office. Now, it is my understanding, and I'm not an expert on US Club, but they apparently only require coaches to register every two years. And they only do background checks, and I think they charge $25. And I don't believe they do it every year. So I'm just going to say it appears that right now your statement of them ignoring safety procedures or what have you, I don't believe that they're doing a proper job on the background checks as required by Florida statute. I'm not talking about in general. I'm just talking about that they're not that there are people that are on the field that may not be vetted to the extent that Florida Youth Soccer does it. And I stand by our risk management program over U.S. Club any day. Sorry, I got a little uh, animated there, but it struck a nerve. Rec players, three, six to eight weeks season, comp player. Tom, I hear you, man. Um, the fees are what they are right now. Uh, they are what they are. They're not changing. Uh, we're not going to reevaluate again. The, uh, six, say, the six to eight weeks, weeks is what the league determines that they're going to play. Our insurance covers them 
the full year, regardless of how much they're out of season. Um, exactly my not- thought, Joel, right? You could have as long of a season as you please. It's FYSA doesn't mandate how short it has to be. So, um, yeah, and thank you guys both. Hey, it's, it is seven, but I'm going to, I'll stay, you know, Eric, Joel, you're free to, to, walk, uh, to leave if you want, but I'm going to answer these questions until we're done. Uh, it's only seven o'clock my time, so I'm, I have a little more luxury here. Um, let's say phase one is not till September. I'm sorry, phase three, um, then tryouts, uh, and f- that changes everything, right? September becomes, it is certainly problematic, um, but we, if phase three starts in September, then players will not be able to practice until September, and we will have to deal with, we will certainly have to make some additional decisions around um, our calendar if that were to happen. What is state cup tournament dates in the fall? Everything is um, should be, all the dates should be on the website. Uh, for the, the the upcoming season, um, what date does risk management finish off for 2019-20? We are going to flip the switch on July 1st, Julie. Uh, technically, our seasonal year does run till August 31, uh, but for so 2019-20 um, risk management would go till August 31st. Um, but we will flip the switch on July 1, so that uh, those that uh, are going to be, you know, coaching or volunteering for next seasonal year would be able to get their background check done. Uh, thank you, Joe, for the for the kind words. Um, thanks for clarifying, Bill. They're mandating that. Uh oh, Bill, I've lost. I'm losing you. Hold on. Let's see. Thank you. Just to clarify, you're mandating the club will be in violation of FYSA's new mandate policy with sanctions if a club starts back early, regardless if they do not have, in fact, have other insurance allowed by county reasons to make sure that all clubs follow no exceptions. I will say, I think it's safe for me to say that there there, there will be consequences, but I'm not able to articulate what those exactly what those consequences would be. Uh, Bill, I'll take that back to the board. Uh, and we when we meet again on May 19th, we certainly can um, can, can have that conversation and perhaps give some additional guidance so that uh, there's clarity. What I don't want to do is tell somebody there's a $500 fine and then decide that they just want, they're willing to pay the fine. Um, So I think we have to give it some thought. Uh, Follow these crazy times and stay safe. Thanks. Thanks. Oh, Dara. Thanks, Dara. Um, What's the difference between cups? Oh, goodness. State cup is the highest level. President's cup's the second tier uh, competition. Uh, for those teams that uh, um, still want to do a national competition, but uh, don't feel that they're um, the top uh, team in the in their age group, uh, both state and national or state and Presidents Cup go on to both regional and national competitions. Commissioners Cup is a regional event uh, this year. Uh, it is uh, for for those uh, competitive teams that again don't believe that they're ready to play at those uh, the sec- top in the, the second tier, but are wanting to still compete at the local level. Um, let's see, what's the difference between state presence um, and futures? Well, futures was uh, our 11s and 12s. It was a step above commissioners, uh, but we, we weren't offering 11s and 12s in presence cup anymore. So we, we set up a separate competition, but futures will not exist uh, for next year. Can teams play in all of them? No, they cannot admin. It's you, you commit to a cup and you play that cup cannot play multiples. Um, stay safe. Seriously, admin. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I'm just reading now. John, Joel, thanks for having this in public. Um, so, Tom, yeah, we're, we're, give let us, we're going to take baby steps on this uh, opening up to public. Uh, we are doing our best. Uh, we want to, op- we want to be more, tra- ha- we've tried to be more transparent. We want to be more transparent. We want to communicate. That's what these town halls are about. So more to come. Futures won't exist because, um, I mean, honestly, uh, the the competition committee uh, decided not to that futures um, league and futures cup did not uh, was not something that FYSA should be doing. Uh, and in and in part that the uh, membership uh, majority of the membership at the AGM last year expressed a dissatisfaction with a competition for 11s and 12s um, that provided for competition. They felt like that that should not we should not, as an organization, do that. Uh, we continue because plans were in place. We, uh, the board, decided to do it for this year. 
uh, with a, uh, an eye towards potential future, no pun intended, but uh, that decision has been made. Future Cup, future league will not exist. Affiliation, reaffiliation notice will be sent out on the normal timeline. There will, uh, we, uh, Joel, if you would work with Rosemary on uh, what are sending out notices. Absolutely. Uh, and Zoom recordings are free and easy. We, so um, thanks, Tom. We, one of the challenges that we have when we do our calls now, um, we do not necessarily parse it out between a public portion and executive session. There are things that we cannot discuss uh, publicly uh, for, for legal reasons. And so um, our Zoom recordings right now, we do not, uh, we're, we're very, uh, very open with our discussion and very honest in our discussion. Uh, I think that uh, we will certainly, again, take into consideration your request. And, and uh, I, can, I can promise you, we do plan the May 30th meeting is going to be public. We will do as, as many as we can do uh, while balancing um, the needs of, of the board uh, and, and our staff. Uh, can we increase referee fees for refs? No, we cannot, that's beyond, that's beyond our control. We do charge the same background check fee, the $40 fee uh, to our refs. That's what we control and we it's the same for anybody that needs a background check. Um, great, thank you guys. Uh, referee pay must increase because there's a shortage of referees. Admin, that is a club and league decision. Uh, you decide what you should pay um, referees. That is not an FYSA decision, nor does uh, the F Florida State Referee Committee. They do not set fees either. And state tournaments, um, it's so if we increase, we can increase the, the referee fee uh, admin. Uh, but keep in mind the teams uh, up until the final four, the teams that are playing in those games are the ones paying those fees. Um, we do actually for for final four um we do not have to pay we don't pay our referees because they're there being evaluated for inclusion in regional and nationals and so they're there they're hand selected uh to be at those events so um, we certainly could raise we could double their fee uh, their re referee fee uh, but that would come out of the pockets of the teams participating in that game so it may not be the best why not postpone the state cup to July or June? We thought about it. That's why we waited so long, admin. We, 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 we really, there was, there was, and I just, I'll be, I think it's fair to say there's still a, a, a few that would like to have held off, um, you know, postpone and kick the can down the road another couple of weeks. I, I think that uh, we, we felt like that we've gone as far as we can. Our go no go date. If we were to try to to put teams on the field, we'd be number one putting them at risk because they're coming out of a, a period of a lot where a lot of kids aren't doing anything. Um, but the, you know, but then we'd be putting them on the field in 95 degree weather with 90% humidity. Um, there's a lot of reasons why it, there is a lot of good reasons why, and there's a lot of bad reasons. Um, and so we, we talked it all through guys. We, it was, we had a two hour plus board meeting last night. I think we spent, uh, a significant, the first part of the meeting was really talking about whether even to, to cancel cups. And uh, it was a lot of back and forth. So this was not a decision we made lightly. If it was an easy decision, we probably would have canceled a month ago. Um, but we did not want to see that happen. Um, I know, Jose, I, I get it. Um, and what I'm hoping to have happen, guys, is that uh, the leagues will fill that gap. Um, so the leagues aren't required to return to play in July um, or June, July timeframe, but the leagues will have the option. So if enough members of a league want to get together, uh, your leagues have the ability to sanction those uh, those games and provide you with an outlet to play the game of soccer. Um, I it it is it is sad. It does make me sad, and and it's regrettable that the the 19s um, don't get to continue on. And do anything. Um, we talked about maybe having the 1819s over the summer. Unfortunately, um, thanks, Tom. Little 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 TMI there, sir. Um, John, just to add one more thing, um, they, they've talked about adding a, the U20 bracket 
to um, regionals and nationals for upcoming years. There's nothing official yet, but there has been uh, talk of it at the uh, regional and national level. So that there, there may be another opportunity for them. Uh, granted, many of them won't be in high school, but still, it would be more like the um, the, the older traditional U19 bracket. A lot, a lot of uh, a mix of college freshmen and uh, seniors. Jose, I hope you don't have to go as far as North Carolina or Virginia. I hope that there's, there'll be local opportunities to play. Um, I hope maybe there's a, an, a maybe a club wants to host a tournament in your area that could bring those teams together. Um, there's there are. I, I'm hoping there are ample opportunities for your team to get on the field without having to travel to North Carolina uh, and, and incur those expenses and incur those risks. Um, that said, um, you know, if you do go, I hope you kick, uh, I hope you hope you win all your games and, and beat the North Carolina teams. Um, uh, is all soccer fields open at the same time? No, um, admin, uh, only the, it, the local, your local, um, mayor, your your county administrator, your parks and recreation, they will decide when the fields actually open. You cannot, if, if even if they opened up today, uh, you would not be authorized. At least there be, you could not go back to the fields and play and be under our insurance. And as has been discussed, uh, you would be subject to uh, sanctions by FYSA uh, for doing so. Wow, should clubs share fields uh, if they want to? I mean, it's, it certainly is. It would be in my mind, it would be an acceptable thing if they can come to an agreement. Um, you guys are being beyond great. Just don't respond. <laughs> uh, we love. Come on now, you know. Tom, Tom and I've had our, our our conversations over the years. It's a, it, it's it's not a bad thing. He, he's going to ask his questions, and I'm going to answer. Right, Tom? Um. I mean, by the time phase three opens, all clubs yeah, fields right. should be open. Right, Tom? <laughs> Tom, have I ever avoided your questions entirely? No, you're a very nice guy. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry. Um, <laughs> Tom Hanks, come on. <laughs> how, how about, no, so everybody tells me Woody Harrelson, but that's just what I hear. Um, the devil has left the building anyway, so it's okay. What's that? The oh. devil has left the building. Uh, Okay. You know who I'm talking about. He knows who I'm talking about. <laughs> I mean, by, by, by the time phase three opens, all clubs fields should be open, right? Admin, I wish that I knew that to be the case. I don't believe that will be the case. I think there will be some, some uh, local um, authorities who will drag it out further. Um, I cannot control for that. I can I, Really, all I can control for is what the governor uh, is saying, and we believe phase three is when it's going to start. I uh, really wanted you to guys, we did consider postponing. We just, we, we could no longer, put, we can no longer delay the decision that had to be made. Um, we thought long and hard about it. Um, I don't mind saying it, it kept me up at uh, some nights thinking about what's the best way to do this, guys. Uh, so yes, admin, and, and by the yes, way, admin, admin, if you would tell me who you are, because you're, you, you know, I, Certainly answering your questions. Don't mind it. I wouldn't mind knowing the name behind the uh, behind the the uh, admin though. Harry. Okay. Uh, Danny. Parks are open in Dade County, but with restrictions. Organized sports activities are now allowed. Okay, Danny. Um, but FYSA sanctioned activity is not allowed until uh, beginning of phase three. Oh, not allowed. Got gotcha. you. Okay. All right. Have I gotten ahead of the questions? It's seven thirteen. I, I'm I'm not going anywhere. So, what would be the guy? When would the guidelines with physical be available? Pro, I mean, more than likely, no later than May 30th, but probably sooner than that. Joel's Joel and Jared are working hard to uh, synthesize that information and 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 be able to put it into a a format that that could be uh, released to the members. All right. We'll give it one more minute. Joel, Eric, you have anything, last comments? No, nothing from me. Uh, appreciate everyone's time. Um, we, we'll be seeing uh, more of these in the future as topics come up that uh, necessitate this kind of forum. Harry, next season starts August 1st. And, uh, I John, wanna... I would just say, 
a, a big thank you to John, right? So a lot of people think that the president of FYSA is a paid position. It is not. He's a volunteer. He has a normal, regular job that he has to go to and still do all of this. And, and frankly, he's probably spent more time on FYSA business than his real job lately. And uh, so we owe him a, a lot of gratitude and a huge debt. And thank you, John. Thanks, Andy. Question uh, I just got on here. Can tryouts be conducted uh, via Zoom rather than face-to-face? -face? Absolutely. Um, uh, starting May 18th, if you want to do uh, tryouts virtually, uh, please feel free to. Um, CDL USA is a decision made by CDL and USA. Uh, Harry, um, can they start with that school opening? Uh, if we're in phase three and we're 14 days beyond phase three, then yes, they can. Um, our, our decision making is not predicated on whether schools are open or not. All right, it is 7.15 Central, 8.15 Eastern. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for the 60 diehards that have stayed to the end. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to um, send them to myself, to Joel. Uh, Eric, on the financial side, Eric would probably be the great person. Uh, Harry, you absolutely have a lot of questions. I could see that. Um, so uh, let's take this offline. Harry, uh, if you want to speak to Joel or I, I guess uh, if you'll send us a text message, uh, my phone number, I'll give it out, 850. I'm going to put it in the chat box if y'all want it because you cannot call me without texting me first. That's all I'm going to ask, guys. Uh, text or email, let's arrange a time, but that's my cell phone. so. A text would be fine. Um, I, if I get a call from an odd number, I will not answer it. Um, from there, uh, I will be happy to to arrange a time. Joel also stands ready to to have conversations during the day. Uh, I am, for those that don't know, I work in healthcare supply chain. Um, you know, I do have a few concerns beyond uh, soccer uh, lately, um, but uh, again, we'll continue. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate it. Yes, uh, John lives in Florida. He lives in Pensacola, Florida. Um, to uh, I address just uh, one last question up there. I, I communication from Brian about all of this yeah. will be going out uh, to uh, the clubs via the normal uh, um, uh, channels tomorrow. We wanted to just have this uh, opportunity first. So that, that information will be out uh, on everything that was covered tonight. All right, guys. Again, great, great thank conversation. Uh, thank you for uh, using the chat box, making it a little easier, not, us not having a bunch of folks trying to talk. I um, hope you all have a, a safe evening. And we, uh, to Joel's point, uh, we'll schedule another one of these when uh, we're at a point where we feel there's enough content to, uh, to come back and, um, and, and meet with you again. Thanks and have a blessed night. Take care.